Brad, if you don't know him, we, we've known Brad, you know, four or five years or so. This is, I think, the third time he's been here to the church, and um, uh, he's a, uh, it's been a church planter and a pastor. He's an author. He's a scholar. He's a theologian. He's a teacher. But more than anything, he's a really good friend who has centered his life on following Jesus and, and knowing him. And, and when he comes, it just draws us into knowing Jesus better. And that's why I really love having him here. So would you welcome Brad as he comes to share with us? You pray? You pray for me? Yeah, I'll pray for him. Thank you, Lord, for Brad. Thank you for having him here with us. Thank you for the gift that he is. And I just pray now that uh, as we're here in your presence, that we would be open and attentive and expectant to all you want to speak to us through him. And we pray that he would know your presence as he's sharing and he would uh, just experience your peace and your joy and your love even in the midst of all he's doing this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. Glassenheit. <laughs> so I'm Brad. Hi. And uh, greetings from my church, uh, Fresh Wind Christian Fellowship in Abbotsford, BC, Canada, where my wife Eden is the senior pastor. And I, I get to do my stuff. And part of my stuff is coming here today to talk about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I hope that no matter how long you've been a Christian, that this morning you'll find out it's even better news than we thought. And if you've never uh, said you're yes to Jesus, but somehow have walked in, in here for whatever reason, uh, my goodness, we have good news for you. And so when we use the word gospel, gospel means good news. It's, an, it's a good news announcement. And, and the good news, the gospel, is the story of Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. And when we try to share the gospel, uh, the gospel is the gospel. What I share might change. What I share needs an upgrade. In fact, these are the days when God is upgrading our understanding of the gospel, our vision of the gospels. He, he's, he's upgrading our way of articulating the gospel. And, and yet all of that stuff is like our vision, our understanding, our articulation, the way we tell the gospel is not the gospel. The gospel is the gospel, the, G, the, the Jesus story. Uh, so what I'm going to uh, share with you this morning is uh, compare and contrast a little bit with the understanding or the vision or the presentation of the gospel that I received growing up, which was uh, it was biblical. It, it was helpful. Uh, I can preach it and teach it with an anointing and people come to Jesus. And yet, did you know God wants to keep upgrading our vision? He wants to in, improve our understanding. He wants to help us come um, to ways of sharing the good news that are actually more biblical and more, uh, well, better. It's better news than we ever realized. And so I'm going to uh, compare and contrast first, first uh, what we might call the juridical view. That's a fancy name for a courtroom drama. Juridical, judicial, legal. And what it does is, uh, and, and you'll find this language in the Bible, but the idea of the, the, the judicial or the legal view is it sort of paints God as a judge. He's a righteous judge. And sin is law-breaking. And we come into God's courtroom, and, and because sin is law-breaking, it needs to be punished. And so uh, uh, the way it's punished is through God's wrath. And so then we bring Jesus into the courtroom drama, and he becomes our defendant. And, and, uh, and there's some really helpful things about, about this, but it's about paying a debt and paying a penalty and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm finding that there's a, there's a way that is, it's a more ancient way. We could call the first way archaic because it's only 500 years old, a way of seeing this. But there's a more ancient way that's at least, you know, 1800, 1900, 2000 years old that the early church fathers taught it. And we might call it the therapeutic way or the, the medicinal way, the remedial way, the, the healing way. 
And in this kind of vision, this restorative uh, understanding of the gospel, sin is not law-breaking. Sin is not legal guilt that needs to be punished. Sin is a fatal disease that's entered our souls. And it's a disease of the suffering of the soul that produces sinful behavior. But the behavior is not the issue. It's not the root of the problem. And so we don't need to come for, for God to come as judge and just punish bad behavior. We need God to come as a great physician to heal us of the sufferings of our soul that produce all that behavior. We know that the Pharisees and the, the scribes, the legalists of Jesus' day, they were good at dealing with behavior. They were good at, deal, at condemning behavior. They were good at punishing behavior. That's the law, right? Grace is about a doctor who comes in and he starts to heal us. Of, it's like he gives us a blood transfusion. And, and so um, that's sort of the second way we're going to look at it. I want to show you both visions so that you can see the upgrade clearly and find out how good the news is this this morning and and uh, so let's begin so in this first in this first vision of the gospel it begins with god creating mankind and putting them in a garden adam and eve and they are created in the likeness and image of god and their purpose is to be in face-to-face -face fellowship with god to be in constant communion with him and to enjoy his presence and even to mediate his presence into the world. And this is awesome. And you know how the story goes. Adam and Eve stumble into sin. They listen to the serpent. And, they, and in, in sinning, they become sinners. And in this version, God, who is holy and righteous and cannot look upon sin, must turn his back on Adam and Eve, on humankind. And so John Kelvin, for example, would say that God's primary disposition towards humankind is enmity. Let me say it in English. His first impression of you is that he's angry. And he's angry because of sin, and, and uh, so that the appropriate response to this sin is, is wrath and punishment, and they are expelled from the garden. And this continues for thousands and thousands of years, such that even when sinful humankind tries to create religions or produce sacrifices or do good works or measure up to this God because of our sinful natures, it is never good enough. And all that we do falls short and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And even our hearts are, are wicked and deceived. But thanks be to God, he loves us so much that he needs to do something about it. And what he does is, is he sends his son Jesus to earth. And in our place, what Jesus does is he comes into that perfect, sinless communion with God that was intended in the first place. And he stands as our substitute and lives righteously and blamelessly in the world and, and in fellowship with his father. And then, of course, the unthinkable happens. Jesus is crucified. And as he's crucified, God takes all the sin of the world and he puts it on his son. And as Paul says, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. And in this vision of the gospel, as the Father uh, has, has imputed all the sin of the world onto Jesus, then in his wrath, he must turn his face from his own son and he pours all the wrath of God, all his righteous anger towards all sin ever onto his son. And, and, uh, and, and Jesus dies. Now, thankfully, that's not the end of the story, right? So, so Jesus comes back to life. He's resurrected. Uh, he ascends to his father, sits at his right hand, and now anybody who believes that this has happened, that Jesus has died in our place and has taken the wrath of God as punishment for our sin, anyone who believes that now can come into face-to-face -face communion with God again. And, uh, and when we die, live eternally with him in friendship with God. 
Uh, but for those who do not believe this, do not accept this, uh, who've, who've not responded to this good news, uh, their backs are still turned on him, and so God's own uh, can, can, cannot be in fellowship with them. And then eventually they die and go into the grave and experience eternal conscious torment. Um, so now there's a bit of like, we better say yes. So that, so that we can experience and receive the love and grace of God. The, I believe that uh, this is what I, w- what I was taught growing up, that this is a vision of the gospel, um, that there, there is a lot of scripture that would confirm this vision of the gospel. It's what I taught in my master's thesis, and it's what I preached as an evangelist. But God is upgrading our vision. God is renewing the expression of the good news and he's saying there's another way to look at this that is older, more biblical and, and uh, much better news. And so, as I said earlier, we call it the restorative view or the therapeutic view, the, uh, the healing view of the gospel. I didn't mention this earlier, but there's a brand new book out called Healing the Gospel by Derek Flood. It's fantastic. It's about this stuff. So, in this vision, we're going to start over. Um, God creates Adam and Eve, puts them in the garden to be his representatives on earth, to live in perfect fellowship, face-to-face friendship with God, and, and, uh, and all is well. And then what happens? Well, we know the serpent comes, he tempts them, they stumble and they fall, they become sinners. And what does God do? Now, from now on, I want you to pay very close attention to the direction of the God chair. God comes looking for Adam and Eve. And he says, what would you do? And they start blaming and they start uh, justifying and they start, you know, and, and and the Lord has to remove them from the garden, away from the tree of life, so that they aren't permanently stuck in this state. And what does God do? He goes with them. And He clothes them. And in spite of the labor and hardship of the curse of the ground, He's with them. And then one day, you know, they start having kids, and pretty soon there's Cain, and he starts plotting to kill his brother. And he, in fact, does go kill his brother. And what does God do? He goes and finds him and he says, Hey, Cain, what did you do? And Cain is like, Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord has to send him east of Eden, where he goes and begins to to establish cities founded on violence. And what does God do? He puts a mark on Cain to protect him from being murdered. And this continues on and on throughout history. Here we have a woman who because of the brokenness in her heart, cannot hold it together in a relationship, and she has one, two, three, four, five husbands and five divorces, and now the man she's living with is not her husband. And what does God do? He becomes man. God comes and sits beside her at a well and says, what you're thirsting for, I can give you. I'm going to get put a well of life right inside of you and it's going to gush up from your belly and you'll never be thirsty again. Here's a man who through greed and insecurity and short man complex has betrayed his own people and now he's a tax collector for the Romans and he's gathering up his funds and he's got his little isolated community and, and everyone hates him. And what does God do? He walks under his tree one day and says, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down from there. I want to eat supper with you tonight as a friend. And his kindness leads to repentance, and Zacchaeus ends up being restored to his community and restoring all that he's stolen many times over. Here's a woman who's been caught in adultery, and the elders have brought her to be punished under the law. She's done a behavior that requires punishment for sin. And what does God do? 
he comes and he kneels with her in the dust and he begins to write there and he says to her, where are your accusers? And she says, they're all gone. And he says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Here's a man who, through whatever series of events, has completely lost his mind. He's mentally ill and he's got a load of demons in him. He's such a wild man that he lives in a cemetery and when they try to chain him up, he supernaturally breaks the chains and tears all his clothes off and it's like, let's leave him in the cemetery. Kids, don't go down there. What does God do? God gets in a boat and he crosses the Sea of Galilee and he steps foot in that area and it's like every principality and power shook because the Son of God was there. And he goes into that incredibly a scary cemetery and he touches the man and he heals the man and he delivers the man and he restores his sanity and he probably gets him some clothes too right and and he's he's made he's reconciled to his community he says can i follow you no just stay here and tell them about me here's a man through uh, whatever kind of random health issues and DNA problems, and, and what do they call that? It's, it, it's when you have a mutation in your cells, ends up living life as a paralytic. There's sickness, which is the physical body, and there's disease, which is the social consequences. And the social consequences in that day were if you had a disability, you were considered cursed by God, and it must have been something you or your parents did. And what does God do? He comes and he kneels by that man and he says, your sins are forgiven. Get up. Take your mat and go home. And he does it. And even when, even, I'll tell you one more. There, there's a man named Dan and Dan grows up in a family where his dad beats him every day. And he belittles him. And Dan begins to shrink as a human being until he cannot connect with his own emotions anymore. And he grows up and becomes a violent man who runs from his emotions into alcoholism. And he terrifies his wife. He terrifies his kids. And he's on the run from God. And what does God do? He finds Dan. And he gets him into recovery, and Dan is in recovery for 14 years, clean and sober, and he goes to church with his wife, and his kids are growing up, and they get to have a real dad. And one day, Dan falls off the wagon, and it starts all over again, the horror. And he's walking through a parking lot on his way to kill himself, and an accountant from our church looks out the window and God sends him. He said, Dan, where are you going? I'm going to kill myself. But maybe you could just take me to the psych ward instead. And so the accountant spends his time with Dan that day and the next day. And, and Dan understands that there's fresh mercy. And that Sunday morning, Dan serves the accountant communion. And even when humankind in our own uh, insanity take this God and put him on a cross and St. Stephen says, we murdered him. What does God do? He says, I forgive you. And he is in ruthless pursuit of us. So much so that even if turning our backs on God, we come to the end of our lives and we end up in the grave in Hades. What does God do? He says, even if you make your bed in Sheol, I am there. And the Lord Jesus Christ goes down and the early church used to talk about the harrowing of hell. And what happens is the Father raises His Son to life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Behold! Look on purpose with the eyes of your heart at what's really there. I'm alive forevermore. And then uh, Jesus says in red letters, and all those who are in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of Man and they will rise from their tombs. And now there is nowhere in the universe where God's love is not. 
Daniel 7 says that it flows like a river from, of fire out of the throne. And this river of fire, which is the love of God, everyone experiences it. To those who love love and respond to love and say yes to the love of God, it will feel like, it, like the pillar of fire in the wilderness did to the Israelites. It will be warmth and light and comfort. But to those who hate love, what happens when we hate love? It's like burning coals on our head. And, and we're tormented by our own conscience for rejecting perfect love and all we would need to do. In the eternal, everlasting love, the relentless, unfailing love of God would be to turn to Him and share a meal as friends. And He loves us so much that if we never do that, He will still be pursuing us. Hey, what are you doing? I'm turning my back on you. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Why would you do that? I love you. It's like, this is really painful. Leave me alone. I can't leave you alone. My river of love flows everywhere. I believe this is good news. I believe that even those in, in, in utter darkness, there's this, uh, 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 the, that her gates are never shut, the welcoming love, the invitation of the bride. All you who are thirsty, come. And to me, this is an upgrade of my understanding of the gospel. And here's two really important reasons why. Number one, in this view, God never turns His back on His Son. He is never against His Son. The Father is never pitted against Jesus. Where did we get the idea that God was punishing Jesus, torturing Jesus, and murdering Jesus? A big part of it came from one Bible verse, and I made an entire theology out of it. When Jesus cries out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the picture I have then is that here's, here's poor Jesus on the cross, but because he's become sin, G Father turns his face from him. And I'm, I'm inferring that from that one Bible verse. But did you know that Bible verse is from Psalm 22? And all of Psalm 22 is a prophetic announcement about the passion of the Christ, about His death and His resurrection, and His testimony about His resurrection. And what Jesus prophetically says in Psalm 22 starts with, why have you forsaken me? But you get to verse 21, 22, 23, and 24, and we have this announcement. I am going to tell my brothers this, and I want you to tell them. He never once turned his face from me, says the word of God. He never once turned his face from me. The father was not uh, punishing the son. Where does Paul say the father is? God was in Christ on the cross, reconciling the world to himself. Zechariah 12 says that Yahweh, God, says to us, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn as one mourns for an only son. And I will pour a spirit of supplication on them and restore them. And so when you're looking for Father on Good Friday, he's not holding a spear or a scourge or a hammer. He's hanging on a cross and he's looking at his murderers, you and me, and saying, I forgive you. Romans 5, even while you were my enemy, I made you my friends. So the Father is never pitted against the Son. And the Son is not saving us from the Father. So this is the second point. is Not only is the Father not pitted against the Son in this vision, He's not ever pitted against you. He has never turned His backs on us. He, he, uh, he is always towards us. He is always for us. He is always in wild pursuit of us like a reckless lover. And he, you are his magnificent obsession. And 
Uh, this is super important because we have given the impression to the world that God is the bad guy and Jesus needed to save us from God. When in fact God became man to save us from Satan, sin, and death, right? We are saved from Satan, sin, and death by this God who took on human flesh and even consented to our sin against him. And he releases us. He forgives us. And he welcomes us home like the prodigal son. So there's a little bit of basic theology going on here that can upgrade our image of God. That it's not good cop, bad cop. It's like, I trust Jesus. He's the nice guy. But wrathful God, like, whoo. No, it, the upgrade in our image of God is this. There's two fundamental truths that we believe as Christians. One is that God doesn't change. Amen? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Number two, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of his likeness. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in Christ in bodily form. What does this mean? It means that we can stop obsessing about proving Jesus was God. We need to start telling ourselves that God is like Jesus. We need a more Christ-like God. And when we have a Christ-like God, we'll go, oh my goodness, this is good news. God is like Jesus. He's exactly like Jesus. He has always been exactly like Jesus. We didn't know that, but now we do. And so this God who is for and in His Son is for and in you. This God who never turns away has never turned away from you. And some of you here may have never said your yes to, to God because you didn't know you could trust that other kind of God. The God whose anger needed to be appeased. But I'm saying you can trust the kind of God who would give his life to forgive you. And some of you, it may be worse because you are Christians. <laughs> and sometimes we as Christians have this sense that like he's turned away from us. You know, Jesus has done all this to save me and then I stumble again. And he can't look on my sin. It's like, where did we get that idea? Where did we get the idea that God can't look on sin? I'll tell you. Habakkuk. Half a verse. Here's the whole verse. Oh God, you are holy and righteous and you cannot look on sin. So why do you? Why do you? Habakkuk even knew that he looks on sin. And he's frustrated about that. But here's the thing. If God didn't look on sin, he wouldn't be able to look at any of us, would he? The fact is, God was in Christ looking on sin all the time. And in fact, he didn't come looking for the righteous. He came looking for sinners. And so if, if God can't look on sin, it would be very hard for Jesus to eat with sinners, wouldn't it? And yet he's always out there looking for sinners and he's looking them right in the eyes. And it's God himself peering into their darkness and pouring light in there, and love in there, and, and welcome in there, and hospitality in there. So, can God look on sin? I wish He couldn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> Could you just leave me alone, God? I'm trying to sin here. It's like, I don't know. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to sin, and, and, and you can't look on sin. It's like, I think I can. <laughs> because I love you. Come back to me. I don't want to come back yet. Maybe in a week. I'm having a good time. Oh, son, this is a quality of life issue, you know? And, and he just like is relentless. And we've even been taught, if you, if you don't have a clean heart, you, you know, you won't be able to hear God. It's like, I wish that were true. When I'm struggling, when I'm sinning, when I'm in the must, you know, mud in the mire, it's like his voice seems even louder. What are you doing? <laughs> Trying to ignore you. <laughs> Not going to do it. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, this, this is I mean, it's, it's, it's awkward. But he's face to face with us all the time with relentless love. And, and, and honestly, it's just like relentless love, unfailing love, everlasting love, 
His mercy endures till you sin next time. No. His mercy endures till you die. No. His mercy endures what? Forever! Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, I pray for my friends here that anybody who has the, the slightest suspicion that you've turned from them because of their sin, that they could open their eyes and find that you're looking straight in their face with kindness and love, with zero condemnation and no judgment. Father, for those who've never said their yes to you, I just feel like what a good opportunity. And so I say my yes to you again. I surrender to your love. And, and I turn to you so that we can share a meal together as friends. And we just thank you so much for all you've done for us. We appreciate it. And that, that you, even in our darkest moment, you did not consider us enemies, but you made us friends. You reconciled us. You did not count our sins against us. And I just feel like I'm supposed to say, don't you know there is nothing his blood can't wash? Nothing. And out of this, his relentless love just keeps flowing. Amen.